Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the Eccles Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Terrence Eccles, and today I have a great episode for you. It's featuring a man who's very well known on this podcast. I believe it's his third time on. Uh, his name is Jordan Jones. Uh, Jordan is a professional basketball player. Uh, he played at Marist uh, with me, and now Jordan and I have a bit of a different conversations than. Uh, the conversation that we've had in the past. Normally we talk about his basketball career or what it's like that he's currently going through. Uh, but this time we decided to talk about a topic and a problem and an issue that Jordan feels very passionate about. And he's, I mean, he's inspired me to become more passionate about it as well. So uh, we're going to get into it. We're going to just talk. Uh, I have a ton of questions for him that I'm going to ask. And uh, it's a great episode. So Please take some time to check it out, and before you do that, please, please don't forget to subscribe. Please don't forget to support the podcast in however way you want to. Thank you for listening, and thank you for watching. All right, let's get into the podcast with Jordan Jones. Jay, my guy. Hey, what's up, T? What's up? What's up? What's up? Yo, so it's been a minute since you came on, man. It's been like what? 2019? Yeah, December 2019. Yeah. Summer 2019? Uh December. We had just played. Oh, uh, December. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a few yeah. That was I mean, that was the first time you came on, but you came on since then, right? Oh yeah, sure did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In uh 20 22, the fall. The fall of 2022, I want to say. Yeah. When you're in Germany. Germany. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, but a lot has yeah, a lot yeah, has a lot, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So so let's get into that. Tell me a little bit about how your journey has changed. I think I called you from Germany and you were talking yeah. to me from Germany. So uh let's recap what happened since then, because I know you've you've been it's been a lot of twists and turns. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh well I played the season in Germany. Uh, it was a great season. Uh, I mean, I didn't play a lot, but the uh, but the guy that was in front of me, he was like, he played in like the Euro League, the Euro Cup, and it was his last year, and he was retired. But you know, I learned a lot, and I really did enjoy my experience in uh, Germany. But I just decided not to come back. Uh, so that summer in July of 2023, I actually my uh, I got a new agent. Uh, and so initially, I had a contract to go to Austria. Uh, I was getting paid more money uh, to go to Austria. It was about a half hour away from Vienna. Uh, and it was a good situation for me. I was going to play a lot. And, but eventually, uh, after I signed a contract, uh, maybe two weeks after I signed a contract, I was playing basketball, uh, pick up basketball. And I was going for an oop, and I came down and broke my foot. And, yeah, just yeah, everything since then has been in the whirlwind. Uh, I had surgery taken care of uh, that July. I had surgery. Uh, later, I started working the school year as I was rehabbing, getting myself back in the shape to go back out there. Eventually, I want to say October or November, I eventually went back out there. I got signed to a team in Slovakia. Went out Slovakia from November to December. Uh, played two games out there. My second game, uh, later that week in practice, I ended up breaking my foot the second time. So I broke my Same foot? Game. Huh? Same foot? The same foot, yeah. Hey. Same foot, same bone, everything, yeah. I broke it twice. So, yeah, after that, uh, I waited, like, maybe six weeks just to see, like, what would happen with my foot, maybe if there was some healing or not. After six weeks, they said it wasn't any healing. And it was maybe, I want to say, the 21st, December 21st, so a few days before Christmas. And I was like, okay, well, I do want to go home. And my agent was like, okay, we can get you out before Christmas. And so they did that, and I went home. Uh, had surgery again in January, and this time they took a bone. They took like a bone graft, right? They took a uh, well, they took some bone from my knee and some bone from my hip and put it in my foot just to make it stronger. Uh, some more rehab, and I want to say around March and April, uh, I started tutoring again. Uh, in the school system, tutoring math. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I did this after school program where we worked with all girls school, and we talked about uh. We talked about like emotional intelligence, and I really enjoyed that. So, I really made in a plan to be a teacher this summer. I, I worked the summer camp in Bristol, Rhode Island for Johns Hopkins. Uh, see students from all around the world, and now uh, 
I'm like a long term sub for social studies this year, so I'll be doing that, and I'll officially be a teacher next year. So, but yeah, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Hey, there's a lot to take from there, but I guess off the off the jump, like, what what is that like? That transition, like, because you know, I know that you you're what 26? 26 yeah 26 yeah you're, you're 26 years old and you got to make a tough decision and it's like man like you could continue to pursue opportunities overseas you could yeah. still you could you know keep working on it and you know same same foot same bone everything that's crazy yeah, i know i know how does know. that happen what are the odds of that happening yeah. i don't like honestly i think the first time uh i might have like went too far. Well, they told me. Uh, well, they told me actually when I broke it the second time. They said, uh, like the uh the intensity of the uh of the practices, like how they were like every day. You, your foot just wasn't ready for that yet, and that's why you know in a breaking the said, Okay, well, fair enough. So, so yeah, I was a lot more cautious the second time. But got you, got yeah. you. And you're you're back one hundred percent healthy. Oh, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, new bone, bone healed and everything. Yeah. Oh, it's it's cool now. Perfect. Hey, the yeah. bone graph worked, I guess. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's good, second man. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Second time's a charm. <laughs> man. Uh, knock on wood, it doesn't happen again. Yeah. But um, no, nah, in uh, going to Rhode Island and working in that tutoring program, uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. I feel like yeah. that was that where you had your sort of change of heart to really be like, you know, mm -hmm. let me stop looking overseas. Let me focus on you know my passion for tutoring and working with kids yeah actually you know you know see i was uh before i started like when i graduated college i was like okay i'm gonna give myself two years and if i'm not where i'm at in two years like for an overseas career then you know I'll, I'll just move on whatever and like that summer after like my first season ended like before i broke my foot i was just thinking like you know do i want to go you know, back another year, like, is this like working for me? You know, like having a, like a, a quarter life crisis, right? And this was all before I broke my foot. And and then Dang. I broke my foot and like, I just, like I was talking to like this girl about it and she was basically saying like, what you were worried about, like, I guess the universe or God like made that decision for you that like, you know, like teaching whatever, this is like the next step in your, I guess your, your journey. So not to say like the decision that was hard, like it was definitely like difficult, but I want to say it was like the natural progression of things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and, you know, that'll do it. I think, you know, when you get sidelined, it's easy to just, you know, get upset and, you know, mm -hmm. start, start getting your feelings and, and really just like lose yourself. But, um, you know, thankfully you, you were able to find yourself and find something else that you're extremely passionate about. And then yeah. also at the same time, the dream for basketball never dies. Like, you, oh, yeah, honest to God, yeah. You're a 26 year old yeah. man, like, and now, and, and, you know, I know now you, you found something yeah. that you actually love and enjoy. And, you know, it could be your career after your basketball career. But, um, what, what was, what, what do you think helped you not necessarily fall into like, you know, negative things and negative thoughts and, and bad things that normally happen when, you know, high level athletes get injured and get sidelined and, you know, have unfortunate things happen to them. What do you think kept you grounded and kept you focused on, you know, your next step and your, your other passions? Uh, having a life outside of basketball, honestly, like they, uh, like, obviously like it's a job you're supposed to easily breathe it, but they do tell you, like, at a certain point, like, really, like, for a career, please have, like, something to do outside of basketball. And I always had that, and I was started, you know, obviously, I was hurt, so I wasn't playing basketball. So I started thinking on, like, things outside way more. I started thinking, you know, I'm about to go with this. I started thinking about, you know, public transit way more. I started thinking about, because that's, like, it, actually, that's how, like, I got to the gym. You know, I didn't stretch because, like, I was late, like, to the workout because the bus was, like, you know, super late. And, you know, I had to rush to get to the gym. I had to stretch really quick. And then I had to play. And, then you know, all this stuff happened, right? So, I, yeah. So I started thinking more about how public transit could be better. I started thinking about how, you know, our cities could be designed. And it kind of just let me down a rabbit hole that I kind of, you know, haven't got out of. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and we'll get into the rabbit hole in a little bit. But, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by that because I'm yeah. – thinking back to our time in college together, you know, we spent four years together at Marist and you were always one of the people who 
you know, you, you'd come back, you know, say we get a day off or yeah. it was, it was a lucky time. We got two days off and we'll be talking about, Oh, what'd you do in the day off? What'd you do on your day off? And then Jay, you would always have something like, I went to a museum, bro. Like, yeah, 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 for real, yeah. yeah <laughs> like you real, always yeah. had interests outside of just, you know, hooping and not to say you didn't put the work in cause you definitely did that as well, but you always found stuff to do outside of it. Cause it like, bro, like when you get to a certain point, like basketball is all mental. So there's this thing like this is like free game. Like so there's this thing where like your brain, like when you, you obviously know, like if you write something down and you leave and then you come back, it's like fresh eyes. Mm-hmm. Basically what you do in basketball, right? So you have a hard practice, you might have a week long practice where you guys are, are pitting and work, whatever. And then you take that day off, right? You don't think about basketball, you just like completely remove it from your mind, and then you come back that next day. And everything feels better. Everything feels fresh. And you you were like are a lot better player. You're a lot more sharper because, you know, you were able to take that day off and your brain was able to, you know, work in the background about, you know, things like that. So, yeah. And that's yeah, a really bro, good yeah, yeah. approach. That's 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 how I saw it. Bro. Yeah, yeah. That's big time game right there, because I know a lot of people um, and I know some some things work for for others in different ways. But I know a lot of people like say it was like a certain move or you know, say they miss like three left hand layups in a practice the day the day before. They mm-hmm. might go to the gym that next day and just work all left hand that whole entire time. Yeah. Where it's like you're saying what you need, maybe take your mind away from it right. and then approach it at a new yeah. angle, get your fresh eyes on it. I like that. I like that mentality. I think Probably that's so. a, good it's way a to look puzzle, at. man. Yeah, it's like a puzzle. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's pretty cool, man. I never I never really looked at it like that. Yeah, yeah that's how I was that's saying. awesome. So um what was the uh I guess right what was the what what was the thought process that went into you deciding to tutor in math, like in, in uh, social studies? What were what were the what's the thing about those two subjects that um are the reason why you you are pursuing tutoring and teaching in that? Now math, not gonna lie, I think math might be the single most important, like skill that you can have like for anything like if you want to be like a like I know a guy who I met at the summer camp this summer at uh when I was in Rhode Island he uh he was like he said he wants to be a librarian he majors in math he majors in math and he majors in uh well he majors in math and he wants to be a librarian my high school coach he has a master's degree in math and he's a basketball coach yeah like math it's just like I really had like a strong like a a strong conviction to really you know attempt to teach you know younger kids math because it's such an important subject. Social studies, you're allowed to you know question things about your world. You're about to you're allowed to critically think about things, and you know you're you're allowed to you know think for yourself, become a leader for yourself instead of you know being told what to think. You know you're allowed to you know a lot more imagination. You know rather than right. you know hey this is what you do. So yeah, that's why I really like math and social studies. That's awesome. Yeah. And and social studies doesn't necessarily just mean history, because I know a lot of people think like all that goes into social studies is history. Like, can you explain a little bit more about like what it all entails and in, in, yeah. under the social studies umbrella? So this is like 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 social studies, like basically like it's not just geography. It's the study of, you know, how geography makes, you know, populations, you know, migrate, you know, why cultures do certain things uh, like the big scope, like anthropology, like human history, not even just, you know, learning where the states are, or learning U.S. history, but like, you know, why communities today are, like, you know, why they are, because, you know, maybe 20 years ago, someone made a decision or, you know, why your world, you know, why Baltimore or why Cleveland or why Syracuse, you know, are designed certain ways. That's like what social studies are. You're, you're, you're studying your, your social, your social area. So. Yeah. And yeah. I guess it's everything that goes into that environment and, uh, that's I know that's something you've been passionate about for a long time, because I remember in I remember in college, you were giving talks about redlining and stuff, oh, yeah, like yeah. That too. So it's it's yeah. it's even more like now that now that I see that this is what you decide to do um, yeah. as your career, you know, the during more, and after yeah. basketball, yeah. it makes more and more sense to me being someone that like knew you four or five years ago. And I'm just like, all right, this makes sense for Jay. Like, <laughs> That's funny, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I was probably, thinking about this. Like, I probably couldn't put it my finger on it because you studied marketing. We both studied marketing in uh, college. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. For some reason, 
I, mm. I couldn't put my finger on, you know, what, what I would imagine you'd be doing. I figured you'd be yeah. still hooping and I just didn't know what else you would do. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some sort of social advocacy I could see you doing as well, which is right. basically what you're doing as well. So yeah, yeah. So it, like I, I about that, like I thought like I would be hooping until I was like 40 years old. Yeah. And then yeah, now I'm 26 and I was like, okay. But I always had yeah, like the, the passion for the social advocacy stuff. I always, you know, and I started thinking about, you know, what's my lane in this? And then I started thinking about, you know, how we gonna move forward with it. Right. Yeah. Right. And I guess um Let's, you know, transition to the main reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you is, uh, you know, I know you lived abroad. It was it, it was your first time living abroad for, you know, a long period of time, uh, you know, being in that Germany area. But I know you traveled a lot all throughout Europe during your time out there. What was it like and how did it change your perception on things, especially on uh, the idea of public transit and the lack of it here in the States and, you know, how did, how did living abroad just influence that thought and idea in your head? Yeah, so like, Oh, tremendously. Cause you know, at first, like, obviously growing up in America, you get used to like one way, like or how, you know, cities are designed, like suburbs, whatever you drive into the city, whatever. And when I was out in Germany, well, actually before I went out there, the, the first thing, like the GM called me, he was like, uh, he was going over the contract. And he was like, uh, he was like, so we don't have a car for you, uh, but we're like the uh, the biking capital of Germany. So we do have a bike for you uh, instead of a car if you want to do that. And I was like, oh, for sure. Easy. <laughs> for sure. And so for like two weeks before I went out there, boy, I was just biking around Boston trying to get my wind up. And yeah. when I got there, like when I landed in Frankfurt, uh, I didn't really see much of Frankfurt, but. We, when I got like to like the the city Munster, all I saw, the first thing I saw was just like twenty bikes driving past me, and I was like, like, <laughs> like what, is, yeah. what is this, man? And then, and then I saw the infrastructure. And then I, I I I saw smaller roads. I saw places where you know cars can't go. I saw you know a road. I saw a bike lane, and then I saw the sidewalk, and mm. I saw like. How that changed, like, you know, the city, people would, it would be like a Wednesday afternoon and like, you know, the main street would just be filled with people just coming in and out. And it was just so beautiful. I could bike to the club. I didn't have to worry about, you know, getting a designated driver. I could just go. I could walk back. I could catch the bus to practice. I could, you know, walk to practice if I wanted to. I could bike to practice. And I just had so many transportation options compared to, you know, in America, when you're not on the college campus, you, you, you're driving everywhere, basically. Yeah. And I was like, you know, it just changed my whole, my whole perspective of thing. Cause like, this, like most of like, that was real. Like, you know, that, that stuff can happen. And it, it just kind of like motivated me to like, you know, like a better world really is possible, you know, for everyone. So, so yeah, that kind of just got the whole ball rolling. That's, that's awesome. And I, I'm glad you got to experience that. And I'm just imagining you getting off the plane and like, you seeing all these people on bikes and everything. Cause um, you know, back in college, uh, what what I start calling you, bike life? Yeah, bike life, bro. Like I would always <laughs> bike. bike in college, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. know, it's crazy. I bike along Route Nine, like Route Nine, one time. Yeah. And like way before I even like knew about like bike lanes and all that stuff, and like Route Nine has a bike lane, but it's just like so bad, and like the cars yeah. go so fast, you don't want to bike. They be all on it too. Yeah, they be all on it, right? Yeah. And and people say like, oh, well, people don't bike because they don't want to. Well, look at the bike lanes. Like, you, like yeah. who would want a bike like that? Yeah. So, so yeah, that right. is, it's dangerous. It's dangerous, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it should be like that. Right. Yeah. And you know, I remember, um, I had a friend because mm -hmm. you you took bike biking serious in college. Like, I just remember after game, even after games, like oh, yeah. the arena was on one side of campus, the dorms was on a way other side of campus. I'd be like, Jay, you want to ride? He'd be like, Nah, man, I got my bike. <laughs> I'm about to be over there real quick. And, Probably uh, like 10 degrees us. <laughs> right. It would be 10 degrees in the middle of the snow, and you somehow figured out how to get back. And um, one funny story is I had a friend who, like, I was walking out with one time. And I was like, I just, I called you Bike Life. I was like, yeah, that's my guy, Bike Life, over yeah. there. And, like, 
she she saw you on a bike and she just saw you riding on the bike. She didn't know like how tall you were or anything. Right. So yeah. she's like, Oh, this guy's on a bike, that's bike life. And I was like, Yeah, that's yeah. bike life. <laughs> and uh yeah, yeah. she she had ended up coming to one of our games. Right. And then after the game, she's like, I know bike life was on the team. <laughs> that's hilarious. Dude. That's funny. He's so tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how what what is that like? Um, you know, being a taller person on on a bike like that is it do you have to find like i know some some things are easier than others what but do you have to find like certain size bikes or do you have to alter your bike in a certain way to make it easier to ride yeah i had to uh like when we first like first got to uh germany we uh because one of our sponsors was like a like the biggest bike shop in the, the city so he uh so when we got there there's like four of us and i was i was six i'm six eight but other guys are like six three, six four, you know, six foot. So I they they're not short, but yeah, yeah. I had to get the biggest bike. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the bike I have here now, uh, I don't ride it anymore because it's just like too small for me. Like my knees hit the handlebars, and yeah. Yeah, it's not bit. Yeah. Dang. Yeah, that's crazy, man. So, um, that's awesome. You kind of got to see like what the future for America could be in terms of just like having more bikeable cities, making it safer. Um, you know, I know a big thing is that they put in bike lanes in a lot of these major cities, you know, I see it all over Cleveland, but like you said, it's not safe at all. Like I'm looking outside right now, there's a bike lane on a bridge that is right outside my apartment and half the time you see cars in it. I'm even guilty of driving my yeah. car on it, on it sometimes. So um, I guess what, what made you want, to advocate for something like that like for the just making public transit more popular or yeah. making other options and modes of transportation you know more accessible because i know one of the things that you just stated was that when you got to germany there were so many ways of transportation and it just made it so much easier to make decisions and go places and uh, you could be smart about it like you said you could walk to the club like it was it was an easier thing to do than it is here in the States. Yeah. So uh, I guess like, what is your ideal sort of um, scenario for what could happen here, especially in major cities? Yeah. So like, it, it, it's crazy. Like I, I have a, like such a strong conviction because uh, like I, I read somewhere that like, was a New York times article that, that stated that the biggest indication like across like, control for like everything democrat like class age race whatever the biggest indication for people to escape poverty is reliable and efficient transportation wow. and yeah exactly right and so you know i i thought back on on like how in october november whatever when i was uh rehabbing uh it was like a lot harder to get gym access so my high school coach he had a gym like way out in the county and i had to i had to catch one bus for like 20 minutes and then I had to catch another bus for like another 20 minutes to get out to the gym. And then I had to walk another 20 minutes to actually get to the actual gym. So Thanks. by the time I got like to the gym, I was already warmed up, ready to go. Yeah. And so, but my high school coach, he was telling me, he was like, yeah, like Jordan used to do that in high school. Like every day you would catch the bus to practice and whatnot. And like, it sucked. Like, don't get me wrong. Like I'll be out there 10, 15 minutes. Like I, the bus just wouldn't come, you know, but mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to go to practice. So I would just wait. So, and I started thinking like, I was like, damn bro. Like, and my high school coach, he told me, he was like, not a lot of kids, like, want to do that, you know, they, and I was like, and then I started thinking to myself, I was like, why should they? Like, why do they have to do that? Like, they should be able to go, like, walk to the gym or bike to the gym. And I started thinking about, like, like, if I hadn't caught the bus or if the bus didn't exist, I wouldn't have, uh, like, been a Division One player. I wouldn't have got the scholarship, right? Right. And I started thinking more, like, okay, New York City, richest city in, like, human history, right? Yeah. It's walkable, it's dense, and it has great public transportation. Yep. Think about Tokyo, think about Paris, think about London. All these cities all have, they're walkable, they're very dense, and they have great public transportation. Yep. And I was like, bro, like, you could be so much richer. Like, cities could be so much more successful if they, you know, invested, like, in dense development, in public transportation, in bike lanes, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, I was like, damn, bro, it, it just adds up. Like, it makes right. sense. Yeah, and it, it does make a lot of sense. And, you know, since... Since you brought it to my attention and started talking about it more more publicly, I think it was back in July is when I first started you seeing I first started to see you see you do more of this. 
I've tried to take it into account and really recognize and acknowledge, you know, if I'm going someplace, like say like I'm hungry, like I want to go get a burger somewhere. I'm like, man, like it might just be easier if I just cut through here, you know, take a left over here, hop on like a butt, like a, a scooter or a bike somewhere and just like get over there that way. That way I don't have to park downtown. I don't have to drive anywhere. Like it might yeah. be quicker and way cheaper if yeah. I do that as opposed to spending so much money in the park. Um, what so I'm sure me being, you know, the average person who, you know, I I own a car, I drive my car a lot, like probably less than the average person. I bought a new car. I bought a new car at the beginning of 2023 and I put roughly 1400 14,000 miles on, which is well below what the average is for someone who bought a car and had it for over a year and a half. What would you like? I have, I just have a lot of questions. So do you mind if I just like rattle these off to you? Yeah, 100%. Okay. I got you. So like, I guess one of the first things that comes up to me when I look at public transit, especially here in Cleveland, the city that I live in, um, is it's not always the safest, you know, yeah. like, the train system here is fine. Like you can get from downtown all the way to the airport. You can get to some of the suburbs on a, on a train or um, the train system's cool. Uh, you know, other systems like taxis and other stuff, and we can get into, you know, taxi and ride share. Cause I want your, I want to hear your thoughts on that as well. Um, but just like the safety of it, it's got a bad reputation here in Cleveland is uh, what we have the RTA and just like, the overall general safety of it. Cause I live near a train, like I've lived near a station. Like it shouldn't be like when I go on the, when I go on an airplane, like I should just be able to like carry my bags over there, yeah. hop on the train and I'm right at the yeah. airport. Yeah. Well, but people are always like, Oh, don't do that. Don't, don't take the RTA to the airport. Just get an Uber and, you know, just call the day. What are, what are your thoughts on people whose main concern with public transit uh, being the safety of it. Yeah. So with that, so actually, so public, it isn't public transit itself. That's unsafe. There's like studies that's been proven. Like when you're like on the bus or whatever, on the train, you're safe you, in most yeah. situations, unless you crash or, you know, unless that you're safe. It's the yeah. like outside the station when you're waiting for the train, when you're waiting for the bus. Right. So with that, you know, we, we talked, we talked earlier about like how like DC, they, uh, they implemented at every bus stop, they implemented like big, you know, not floodlights, but like lights at every bus stop. They have bus shelters. They have wayfinding signals that say, you know, bus coming in a certain amount of minutes. And, you know, people would feel a lot safer, you know, mm -hmm. if there was like a camera right here, a light right here, and they had like, they know when the bus was coming, like it was on a board, right? Uh, but that takes, that costs money, right? Yeah. So this is this is the issue, right? So not a lot of these public transit systems, they, they don't have a lot of money, right? To to afford things like that. Uh also frequency would help. Like if a bus, if a bus came every or a train came every four or five minutes, you're not worried about getting robbed because I mean, but you're not gonna be out there very long, right? Right. So you, you so with that, but all these things cost money, and that's the issue, right? So like cities, right? So let me go on a tangent here, right? So okay. yeah, yeah, cities cities cause like they the way cities make money, a large portion of it comes from property taxes, right? So a long time ago, back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of like cities, Cleveland probably, I know Baltimore is terrible at it, but a lot of them gutted their downtowns for parking garages and parking lots, right? So when you do that, right, uh, the property value assessment of like a property, it goes down, right? So if a city is uh, has a building that's like an apartment complex, right, for people, and let's say the property tax is like what? 50,000, right? 50,000 a year, whatever, for property taxes, right? You tear it down and you just build a parking lot, right? Now the property tax assessment is maybe, let's say, I want to say 10,000 a year, right? So the city collects, you know, $40,000 less, right? So you multiply that by millions of dollars and you multiply it by, you know, tens of thousands of parking lots, right? So now cities have no money. Now, you know, cities can't invest in public transportation. Cities can't invest in schools. Cities can't invest in public safety, right? Now, you know, that's the issue, right? So, you know, that's basically now... The big issue is advocating for, you know, cities to, you know, 
you know, reinvest in cities so property tax revenue can go up. You know, that's that's really what it is. You, the cities need more money to be able to invest in the public transit. And that's what, you know, the more of the advocacy is. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Like you can see the value in the value of an apartment complex versus the value of a parking garage is right, exactly. so, so different. And I'm sure you definitely don't make it back by charging right. anyone who comes into the parking garage where you could make just by taxing it as, you know, a place where people live or a place where people work or a place where people buy stuff or something like that. So what what would you have to say would a, would a better building design be to include like, you know, I know a lot of building, a lot of more modern buildings, especially for apartments, have yeah. parking garages built into like their bottom floor or whatever. Like yeah. my my building personally, the yeah. whole first floor, there's no apartments on it. It's all parking. And then the the underground floor as well, the basement floor is not a basement or nothing. It's just parking. So it's yeah. two floors of parking on a seven floor building. So what what would you have to say about that sort of design? So T, let me uh so the the basement parking lot, right? The bottom is it like ever like full, like completely full? Uh it wasn't full up until maybe a few months ago. And then it doesn't like it's not always full because it just depends on the residents who live in the building and then those residents purchasing parking spots down there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's this thing, right? And we talk about what people can do, right? There's this thing in most American cities called parking minimums. And this is uh so basically like for every apartment complex, let's say, for example, right? You build one, like for every one bedroom, right? You get three parking spots, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, for example, right? So that I'm sorry, where am I? Oh, I'm going somewhere with this, but can yeah. you like yeah, restate your question? Yeah, yeah. So, like, what would you say about right. like is it an intelligent design to build parking oh, lots okay. within to like apartment buildings or something like that? Because you can still tax it as an apartment building, and then you also get the benefit of having a parking area for people who want to drive their cars. Okay, yes, actually. Yes, that is an intelligent design. Uh, because I think parking garages are much better than parking lots. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, parking lots are just like like terrible. It, it's just not. It doesn't good. make sense. Uh, yeah, it's just like it's like flat land full of cars. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, parking garages mixed with like you know uh, apartment complexes. I think that's like the best you can do. Uh, with parking, uh, I think you should. Uh, I think street parking like curb parking is hard to find i, I think in downtown cleveland you're same in downtown baltimore mm -hmm. i think it should be uh a lot more expensive so people park in parking garages mm. you'll you'll keep the streets clear of cars because they're right gonna... yeah and but in the apartment complex situation right there's this thing called parking minimums that most cities have where you have to build like a certain amount of parking spots for every you know one bedroom unit or whatever yeah. right and so that what that does is it actually it, it it wastes space because you know obviously as you say like the parking lot is on like it's not I mean it's like getting full but it's not like one hundred percent right yeah exactly yeah yeah so they uh so parking minimums right they uh it, it wastes space uh the property developer uh the costs are passed back on to the tenants and higher rents right mm. so you have cheaper rents if you didn't have parking minimums right and but you also will have more space for housing right so yeah. Your rents will also be cheaper because you have more space for housing, and yeah. the property tax assessment will be a lot higher because you know you have more housing. Yeah, yeah more housing, right? So, so yeah, parking minimums yeah, it should definitely be abolished in every city. Yeah, parking minimums don't make any sense, man. Like, I think why would they build three parking spots per room? Like, I can understand if you're like a couple that moves in, and you both want to park your cars. Like, fine, that makes sense. But I mean, at, at the end of the day, like. In downtown cities, you really only need one car per family. Like, it, it really that, isn't. Yeah. If that, exactly. exactly. So, yeah. like, one person, especially in today's work-from-home environment, where one person could take the car and the other person could stay at home, and it's super easy. Or, you know, if you, tra you travel together, drop you off here, pick you up here. Yeah, it doesn't – parking – yeah, having a parking minimum doesn't make any sense. It just yeah. influences people to be like, Oh, I can fill up this garage. So let me go spend more money and buy more cars and only <laughs> contributing to more of the problem. That's it, man. That's it. That's it. There's this is the thing, yo, there's this word called induced demand. And it's basically like the more you build like parking lots and highways, the more you invite people to buy cars. And yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. That's what we've been doing for like the last 40 years. Yeah. That's crazy. And yeah. that and that makes a ton of sense. And also I like the idea of because when you look at it, parking garages in downtown Cleveland and downtown Syracuse, they cost so much money. Yeah. And then you if you find like if you're lucky enough to find a spot in the street, you're like, man, I'm gonna just do that because it's like it's two dollars to park in the street for an two hours versus ten dollars to park in the in that garage or twenty dollars yeah. to park in that garage. Should be the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bro, for some of our games at the Guardians, bro. Right. If there's like a Cavs game at the same time because we share a garage, yeah. Bro, fans have to pay up to sixty dollars. To oh, park their car oh, wow. in the garage oh, wow. to go to a Cavs or Guardians game. Yes, that's sixty. Crazy. That's almost yeah. the price of a ticket. Are the arenas they like right next to each other in the arenas? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. the baseball stadium and the in the um basketball arena, they're they're connected by not not physically connected, but they have a lot connecting them. Yeah, oh, yeah. including oh, yeah. a parking garage. Yeah. Y'all yeah. got is that like a train connection? Like to go to the stadium? Uh there is actually there oh, is nice. Uh, an RTA that goes to not to our stadium, but you can get it to go to Rocket Mortgage, and then you can just walk over to Rock from Rocket Mortgage to the ballpark. So, yeah, I mean there there is options to do that. Um, and what a lot of people do is they'll park at this one spot, and then there's like an underground passage. Yeah, they'll just walk on the underground passage, and then it'll take you up uh, to Rocket Mortgage. So, I mean there are some good systems in place. Yeah. here in cleveland but you know like you said it, it ain't gonna be like dc where they could just put all the money towards like having floodlights and you yeah know, just, uh, the wayfinding signals yeah, yeah the yeah. wayfinding yeah. signals yeah. And yeah all that they, they aren't gonna build structures like that here in cleveland like you know we, we don't gotta like that i'm sure baltimore is a similar city like i get rid of those parking lots man Jeez. yeah exactly yeah. yeah exactly no and i'm i'm gonna start yeah. looking i'm gonna start a new petition man you know yeah. Get rid of abolish parking lots or something. Yeah, yeah. Abolish parking minimums. Yeah, parking minimums. Yeah, yeah. parking minimums, parking lot. Yeah, all that good stuff. All right, I got another question for you. Is that yeah. cool? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, bet. Let's get into it. Um, what what are your thoughts? Oh, let's let's get right to uh, what are your thoughts on taxis and rideshare companies? Do you think they help or uh, do you think they're a help or a hindrance to the uh, public transit? Uh, I think, great question. Uh, you know, I'm kind of torn on that because it's like people only catch Ubers and taxis if they, uh, I can't say that people, they catch it in New York City. Uh, yeah, I just, it's tough. Uh, I honestly think like ride share companies and, and, and taxi, I, I think ride share is good. I don't think ride share should be privatized. I think it should be a mm. public, uh, utility. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, Baltimore has it already with, like, a mobility link, but it's only for elders. I think if L.A. has, like, something similar, but it's, like, it's such a, like, a really small scale. But I think uh, rod sharing and, and tech, I think all that stuff should be uh, a public good, a public utility. And uh, mm. I think there should be a lot less cars on the road, a lot less private vehicles, and you can use, like, you know, the rod share service, whatever. But uh, right. I think it should be a public utility. I think they're good, but I just think they should be public instead of private. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good idea, too. I think it'll it's in everyone's best interest to make it somewhat of like a public good, just because sometimes Ubers get expensive, like, um, and then you get into like the, Uber, the culture of Ubers and everything. And I, I mean, in a city, in, in New York city, nothing's ever going to really overtake like a taxi or yeah. something like that. It's just so prevalent there, but like yeah. here, like taxis aren't that prevalent. Like it's like a couple of year and there, but like, Majority of the time, you're getting an Uber, you're getting a Lyft, you're getting yeah. something, yeah. some right. sort of, you know, rideshare, rideshare company to to come and pick you up. So, um, yeah, I I definitely think like mm -hmm. privatizing it, you know, there's there's some good, some bad. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but like, yeah. yeah, some sort of like a regular, like a more regulation. Yeah, like more regulation, make it more of like a public good and um just making it the more prominent and more popular way to travel as opposed to you know let's all drive our cars to this giant like spot and everything all the traffic you know, yeah and, and start yeah. all this traffic yeah. exactly exactly so okay that's interesting um 
what so yeah okay he, what what do you have to say to people who would say like okay right public public transit may work in cities like munster or um you know in countries like germany or you know france or you know whatever whatever country in europe you're talking like you're in yeah. and you you think they do a good job of it japan um because they're small countries like yeah. the, the size of a lot of those countries is the same size as a state here in the united states what do you have to say to people who say the u.s is too big for you know a easy or convenient public transit system I would say uh, that's a lie because uh, China is of comparable size to the U.S. and China has a transnational high speed railway already. Oh, yeah. uh, I would also say that like half of the U.S. is empty uh, once you get past mm. the Mississippi River and until you get to California. So, yeah. I mean, like, honestly, the biggest issue with bringing U.S. public transit to like, uh, yeah, bringing the U.S. like high speed public transit is the fact that there's so much like space, like so much sprawl in like the cities, like. Like Houston, it would be hard to like have a rail system because like once you get outside city limits, it's like the density like kind of plummets. So it's like where do you like have a transit station at? So yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. But to say like the size of the U.S. is the issue is crazy because China is of a comparable size and built a high speed railway in like fifteen years, and China has three billion people. And yeah, you know people who catch a train in China then they do fly. So wow. I mean, it's definitely there to build it if the money was there. It's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my bad. Oh, one more thing. Jesus. Prior to like, I want to say 1920 and 1930, the U.S. had like the best railway system in the country. L.A. had the best like streetcar network like in the world. Uh, New York City, obviously. I mean, trains back then, like 100 years ago, were faster than trains today. So, I mean, wow. like, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just the money, bro. It's literally just the money. And, and what do you think happened? Did the money just go towards, you know, roads and highways and cars? Oh, quite literally. So look, so uh, back, I want to say back in the 1950s, after World War II, uh, Eisenhower, uh, he saw like well, how Germany like developed their, uh, the Autobahn, right? Mm -hmm. so this, is a, this is another thing, a car centric, like, well, that's why I don't believe the BS that people say. So okay. <laughs> okay. What, what's the make of your car? Uh, Jeep. Where'd you, oh, Jeep's are American, right? Yeah. What was the car before you? What was that? Oh, that was a Kia, yeah. Where did they make keys at? Japan? Or yeah, Korea? Japan, Korea, one of them. Yeah. But they both have high-speed rail systems. They both have public transit in every single city. Look at Germany. They have public transit in almost every single city. Yet, I mean, what? Are we talking Audi? Are we talking BMW? Are we talking Volkswagen? Mercedes. I mean, they even have the Autobahn in Germany, right? Yeah. So it's just like it, it, there's a big issue with, like, I don't know what it is about the U.S. where it's like the cars are just... I don't know. Like, it, it's just like other countries are pretty car centric, but they still have like stuff in place. And it's just the U.S. that doesn't. So I just, yeah, I don't know. It changed some minds. I don't know. Okay. Well, here's a, here's a good question for you then. Um, when you talk about a country like China and Japan, yes. the more collectivist societies uh, where. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's sort of where Mm -hmm. where that disconnect sort of happens because you know here in the state we're very into individualistic you know it's a capitalist society like everyone wants to do well for themselves and do well for their families and then it's it's very in individualized and sectioned off and quite literally segregated in a lot of ways um do you think that has a lot to do with the fact that we feel so individualized that it's part of our culture to where everyone owns a car, everyone has their own sort of way of transport transporting themselves. Like you, they to where they don't want to rely on like public transit or others to take them places. Well, that's even like well, even with America, I mean, yes, okay, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean you can't build it, right? So, I mean, New York City, obviously, I mean, like the richest country in the world, uh, in human history. I mean, they have a subway system. I mean, DC has a subway. I mean, like America has a subway system. Western Europe, I would say, has similar ideals of individualism to the US. I mean, Australia does, yeah. New Zealand does, Canada does, right? Yeah. And I would say, like, I mean, even if you don't want to like catch public transit because you feel like, oh, I want my own space. I mean, it's nothing to buy e-bike. I mean, you can buy e-bike. Yeah. Individualize it yourself. 
You can yeah. walk. I mean, if we have more dense communities, you could just walk. I mean, you can have your own space. You can have your own, like, cheaper housing. I mean, everyone wants to move out at 18, but we can't because everything is expensive. Hey, look, if we had more housing, housing would be cheaper. So you can move yeah. out at 18, you can have your own space, right? Yeah. So, I mean, Americans talk about, okay, in, individualistic, but when we uh, when we don't allow people to, to be individualistic, you know, because there's, like, no... No way for people to get around or people can't afford a home right now. It's like, like, what are we doing though? We we talk about, you know, yeah, yeah. We talk about individualism, but it's just like, you know, we don't allow people to really do that. Yeah. Unless you're like rich. Yeah. Right, right. And I really like that e-bike point. Um Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. E-bikes, I'm sorry. E-bikes are like, I'm buying like, yeah. <laughs> like so hard on e-bikes, bro. Yeah. Right. Right. It's and and that's something that's definitely worth like investing your money into because think of all the the function you can get out of it like i'm thinking i'm thinking of my own personal situation here yeah. in cleveland like mm. you know i can see my i can see my the place where i work from my apartment like i can see a grocery store i can see a park i can see you know uh a restaurant like right. i can see all this stuff from where i'm sitting right right at this very moment yeah so like if I had, if I had an e-bike, you know, I do walk a lot, but like if I had an e-bike, I'd be able to get, turn a 15 minute walk into a two minute drive, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it's such an easy way to like get from point A to point B without having to, you know, start up your car and, you know, just waste time on the roads and, you know, deal with traffic and all that stuff where, you know, I could just hop on a bike. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still like I'm so big on e-bikes, bro. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not I think big. I think if you live in a, like a more metro area and a more downtown area, um, I I definitely see the value in having like a bike or some mode of like other tr- p- yeah. like a scooter. Like electric scooters are so popular here. Like yeah. something like that, yeah, and it right. gets you more active too. It makes you walk more. It makes you get outside more. It's it could be nothing. I don't see many ways that it, it it could, you know, deter your life or make your life harder. This helps. Yeah. And you save more time for yourself because now you don't have to go to the gym. You don't have to drive and go to the gym. You just get your exercise in throughout the day because you walk everywhere. That and that's another great day, yeah. Jay. You coming you coming with the real like the the real good stuff today. Cause you know, I woke up kind of sore, like yeah. didn't necessarily want to go to the gym today. I said, what could I do? as my exercise you know today we did um you know in in memory of the the people who lost their lives on 9 11 at the ballpark people were just walking and running the stairs Mm -hmm. i thought man what could be like a little extra workout i could do um as opposed to you know driving my car to the stadium and then start walking up the the steps and you know participating in you know the, the the memory of the people who lost their lives I just walk there and then that's double the workout. Yeah, and I, I really don't got to go to the gym now. Cause I already got, you know, how many steps did I get? 15,000 steps in. Oh, yeah. So yeah. there it is right there. So in, in doing that, it's just, right. it's so important. And it, it, it's such an easy way to, you know, get that exercise that's necessary. Cause you know, a lot of people, Hop in a car, drive, sit in the desk all day, drive back and just chill, watch Netflix, turn on the, you know, cook food and whatever. And that's it. people gain weight, but it's just like, uh, well, okay, it's hard to go to the gym after work. It's really yeah. hard to go to the gym before work. Yeah. Okay. So how are you gonna get your exercise, right? Okay. Yeah. Now you can you can catch the butt, you can bike you can bike to work. You can yeah. walk, whatever. That's that's really hard to walk to work. But uh you can catch the bus wherever you gotta go at work. I mean, maybe if you work in like downtown the city, you can just walk around the city. Maybe yeah. if you work in the office park, maybe they have some green space you can walk around the office park with your coworkers on break, whatever. And that's how you get your exercise in. But like walking, like if we built like more, like there's a difference between like if there's a five minute walk, like okay, so we we talk. Let's all right, we're on the topic of walking, right? Yep. So if we want to talk about walking and making walking like more appealing to Americans, right? We have to think about you know like where are we walking, like around, like how our cities look, how our suburbs even look about when we walk, right? So a five minute walk, right, next to a, a highway on one side and like a parking lot on another side, right? 
let's say a five minute walk, right? Compared mm -hmm. to you got a five minute walk with a bunch of trees over your head, right? Mm. And, and there's no cars on the side of you. It's just like a big park, right? And it's a five minute walk. Now, what's the better five minute walk, right? The park, the parks, and the trees, right? Yeah. Now it's like okay, right? But most cities don't look like that. Most cities look like the other one, right? So even if it is a five minute walk, if your walk is like the road isn't paved, there's no sidewalk, you know, the cars are going by really fast past you. You're not gonna want to walk, right? So yeah. that's another thing, like you, how we think about how we design our cities, you know, our, our sidewalks, our roads, our road speeds. Like even you said earlier about how you drive fast in the bike lane, bro. It's not your fault. Like it's the, I, I do the same thing. Like I catch myself driving over the speed limit sometimes, <laughs> but it's because our roads are designed that way, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we talk about individualistic and collectivist cultures, right? So Germany, right? They uh they have the autobahn. The autobahn has no speed limit, right? Right. But if and but also Germany has like some of the lowest like car accident rates in the world, right? Yeah. So so look, so the way Germany and German engineers see the road, they see it as uh if there's a lot of accidents on the road, they see the road as a problem, not the drivers. But in America, mm. you see the driver as a problem because of indiv individualism instead of like the road mm. being, right? So that's why, you know, even if people say slow down, drive fast, they're putting the blame on like the person instead of like the bigger system. Like, okay, well maybe if we like made our road smaller, people would drive slower, you know, yeah. automatically. So so yeah, it's just like, bro, it's like when you see around the city, bro, you start seeing a whole bunch of stuff, bro. I'm telling you. Yeah. 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 And you know, not I, I know that not everyone gets that opportunity to live in a different country. And that's mm -hmm. that's what basketball is able to bless you with. And you know, I'm glad that a person like you gets to see it because then you come back and you you share your thoughts and you share yeah. your your opinions and you know you advocate for things that can make this country better um i guess my my next question uh for you would be what okay yeah what what do you think about how people are moving towards more of a um work from home hybrid that type of so I guess, you know, commutes are becoming less and less popular, less and less uh, common each and every day. Like, I think some companies are starting to move back away from remote work just because of yeah. how bad the product of the work has become. But other companies are moving towards re remote work just because of how uh, inexpensive it is uh, for to, to how they operate their countries. So what do you think the impact of the lack of commuting or the less how mm -hmm. how po less popular commuting is becoming what do you think that is going to impact on the advocacy and the potential uh implementation of more public transit systems people will get really lonely like like mm -hmm. I, it's just like like if you live in the suburb right if you live in a single family home where your neighbor is not next door your neighbor is like on the other side of the fence or whatever. Yep. And you're working from home. You may be in a house 12 hours a day and you live by yourself. You haven't talked to anyone a whole day. Yeah. And let's say the pandemic happens and you've been working remotely for a year and a half, whatever. That's a lot of time to be alone, be with your thoughts. And either you can Not go with two years, right? You can get like really depressed. You can get like really you know, down with yourself, like, why is this happening? It's mm -hmm. happening because of where you live at, because you can't go mm -hmm. outside and just talk to someone. So even with the commute, the, the, the day of the commuting, like ending, it's like, okay, now you're home, you're alone, you're working from home, you're not talking to anyone. Why is that? Okay, why can't you just go outside and go to the park and say hello to someone, right? Right. Now, you know, this is where people start thinking more like, okay, now how can I, I want to move to the city, right? So, I mean, people are moving to cities more, by like 2050, like, Three fourths of the world population would be in cities, so yeah, it's definitely mm. yeah. I don't know. Well, don't fact fact check me on that. I don't know. Right, if that right, right. Accurate, but a lot yeah. more people are moving to cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's just so convenient. Like <clears throat> as nice as the houses are, you know, where I grew up, I grew up in the suburbs, um, or like going out to the suburbs around like Cleveland and Greater Ohio. Like as yeah. nice as those houses and those neighborhoods look, mm -hmm. like now that I'm getting my first real experience of like being in a city being so close to downtown yeah. bro i can't see myself like living outside of this area ever yeah. and like you know granted i'm in my mid-20s like i'm not about to like 
start a family, you know, get a dog and all that. But like, from where I'm at in my this point in my life, like being in the city is ideal. Yeah, and for oh, yeah. a lot of people, it should be. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. But it's, it's even crazy as you talk about like the the way the houses are designed, like the big mansions or whatever out in like the county, or whatever. Yeah. Like, can we not talk about New York brownstones? Like, are they mm-hmm. not like mansions like right next to each other? Those are I, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Like five, six, seven floors almost. And like, I mean, the space is the same as like a house out in the suburbs, but it's just like you know, it's it's yeah. a lot more vertical rather than horizontal. So yeah, I mean, you can still have all the space you want. You can just have it in the city. I mean, so it's right. Just that- Exactly. And, you know, there's a bunch of townhomes in my neighborhood and they are beautiful, man. Like they got the little roof, bro, See? rooftop, yeah. you know, balcony or whatever is, yeah. oh, that's the number one thing I need when I get like a house. You don't see too many, you don't see too many like big houses in the suburbs with mm-hmm. like balconies and stuff like that, just because like, there's no need for them. You, you know, you got yards and all that, but like, being at the top, there's nothing, I don't know, nothing beats the vibe of being at the top of a roof and just, you know, hanging out and looking out and people watching and I've been out. Yeah. And, and then the socializing yeah. that comes from it too. Like you said earlier, like people get lonely, bro. So yeah. that's, that's another really good point. Um, I, I only got a couple more questions for you because I don't want to take too much of your time. Oh, keep coming, <laughs> man. I can talk about this all day. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, what do you so what what does like your utopia look like? Like, is it more bike lanes? Is it more better public transit system? Is it like a full size around the country? Like, not necessarily in like middle America, but like yeah. something going down the east coast, something going down the west coast. Um, you know what 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 is what is your like utopian society look like? I want to be able to wake up. <laughs> So like so like a utopian society for me is I live in Baltimore and I have a job in New York City and I can mm. Baltimore New York City every day because you know the trains are so fast that would be yeah. ideal for me and when I come back to Baltimore I uh I don't need a car right uh the neighborhood I live in it's a grocery store right around the corner there's a coffee shop right right around the corner there's a a public library there's a there's a public park right there's like no cars in our neighborhood right and all we do is bike and we we all know each other in the neighborhood right that would mm. be like the ideal situation and you know commuting to work whatever i'll be able to just hop on the train and just just go like all across the country wherever it, and it'd be so quick that it would be like that for everyone right i, I, right. I want to say yesterday i saw like four kids like on a bike like going across a parking lot and I almost shed a tear because I was like, damn, imagine if we lived in a world where they actually like didn't have to go across a parking lot. They had to go across like a field of green space. Yeah. So, yeah. Stuff I was thinking about. Yeah. That's and, my, bro. yeah. And, and I mean, it makes a lot of sense, especially if you, I, I don't know how fast some of the the railroad systems could get with yeah. the, the high speed railroad systems, but you know, you think like a plane ride from DC to Syracuse is 45 minutes. Like, oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so a plane ride from DC to New York is what? Probably like a half hour, 40 minutes. Like, yeah. If you could make a train go even like half that, half that speed, like at a high speed, on a high speed railroad, or maybe even a quarter of that speed, like 90 minutes, New York to DC in 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Perfect. Yeah. yeah like, what? what is that? Like a third of the speed of yeah. a plane. Yeah. I think but that's possible. To, yeah. yeah, it's possible, but you also you gotta factor in like the fact that you don't have to go to a bag check and check in or whatever. You don't have to do yeah. it. Yeah. You can just get there and then right. You just hop on a train and you go home. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. It, China has that. China has like like the same within that same distance, they have it already. Like within 90, like from Shanghai to Beijing, it's like 90 minutes. And it's like the wow. same distance from like DC to New York. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. Like I can that's I can weird. just I can see it. It sounds it sounds amazing because like you you get that sense of community, you get that sense of, you know, you, you really get to en- enjoy your city while also being able to work like an ideal job and yeah yeah I man that sounds that's that does sound like a a great utopian society. So what are what are like I guess like the elementary level steps that we can do each and every day as Americans to try to 
get get there and just to enjoy you know whether it's public transit or, or biking or some yeah. of this other stuff like what what are some of like baby steps you could take towards that you can always drive less if you feel there's a a, a situation where it's like ah well you know if it's like ah you can walk right that's one thing you can do second thing you can do is uh a lot of cities have it. I don't know, like, how many cities have it, but you can always call 311. 311 is, like, your, if you want, like, a, a actually, this summer, I didn't even do it. Someone in my community did it. There was, like, a, a traffic calming study uh, that someone wanted to do, and where basically they want, like, speed humps in my community, right, to protect kids and, like, have cars slow down. Mm-hmm. And just call 311 and have that done for, like, your wow. your community, right? And if no yeah. one calls back, if no one, like, calls back and say, no, we don't want that, they'll just build it, right? And but the thing is, they don't pick up when people call back, so they just build it, right? Mm. So, so yeah, so you can just call three one one. You can bike less. You can you can walk more. You can uh take pictures of your city. Use social media more. Build a community. Like one thing mm. I really want to do is when I uh you know get more get more friends for myself. I want to you know build a community where you know like every Sunday, you know we may play basketball or have we may go eat and we might build like you know, a few bus benches for like the community, right? We put them out there. We might, you know, plant a tree somewhere, right? And, you know, these things, like they start early, right? So they start early. So like Amsterdam, I want to say back in the 1970s was like very car centric. And people like one day woke up and said like, you know, F that, we going like, you know, we going to bike more. We going to build like bike buses where we just going to fill up the whole street with bikes, you know, mm-hmm. after cars, you know, whatever. This is like, we, cause we want to show like people like, yo, this stuff matter, right? Lo and behold, 40 years later, you know, Amsterdam is like, you know, a great city. I don't think anyone would say no to moving to Amsterdam because, you know, of what people did 40 years ago where they just woke up one day. It was like, you know, like this ain't it. Like it's time to change the world, you know, and it, it just starts small, you know. So, right. yeah, I'm trying to work on some things myself. Yeah. You know, build a community. That's like the biggest thing I'm trying to do right now. So, OK, there yeah. you go, Jay. I And, and I like to hear that. Um, OK, a couple more questions yeah. for you. I know I just said that, but. Um, a couple of these aren't necessarily related to uh, public transportation. I just, you know, these these are helpful things that I think you can you can share with the world and, and sort of um, and sort of help people gain better perspective because I think you have a great perspective on things. Uh, oh. What have you enjoyed most about teaching? Uh, I will say, uh, when students grow, like uh, mm-hmm. when you when you teach them a subject and it's like ah. Uh, you know, I don't know, like, what am I supposed to do? Or, like, as soon as it's, like, really quiet, really unsure of the work. But, you know, over time, they start to open up more. They start to really, you know, trust themselves and understand the process and, like, retain what they what they learn. I swear to God, it's, like, the best thing ever. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and like, you see the same thing in coaching when, you yeah. know, players are able to get something down. Yeah. Like, what? when, when are you going to teach someone to perfect the jump hook just like you uh, did? I don't know, man. Honestly, I, I really – you know, I've been working with my high school coach. She uh, – because he, he runs, like, an after-school program. Mm-hmm. But he also, like, coaches basketball. So I'm definitely trying to, you know, tap it with him with that. Yeah. Okay. Let's come soon. Let's come soon, man. Right, right, right. Exactly. Hey, we got we got time, man. Mid-20s, you know? Yeah. Um, That's another thing. That, hey, hey, so, you know, I got to say this. Like, so yeah. – when I was at the, the camp, like the Johns Hopkins camp, right? I was I was 26, right? And yep. most of my other coworkers like 18, 19, 20, right? And you know, I was like, damn, you know, you know, I was like, damn, you know, <laughs> that was, they, 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 that's what they were saying to me. Yeah. But it was like, like, bro, I feel like one, I can, I'm more athletic than you guys. Like, <laughs> I feel like a lot more vigorous than you guys. Like, I swear. And then like I met this girl at the camp. And she was like an instructor for uh, one of the classes and she was 26 as well. And I met her and we were talking, we were like, bro, like at 26, like, I don't know who brainwashed us into thinking like that was old, bro. Cause like, I feel young. Like I was telling, yeah. I was telling one of the, my coworkers, he like 18. I was like, bro, at 26, a lot of people have kids. A lot of people have bills. A lot of people, you know, like life happens, but if you can stay curious about the world, you can like try to limit those things. Like bro, at 26, you'll feel like, the rest of your life is ahead of you. I mean, knock on yeah. wood, like for sure. Like, right. Yeah. No, in the, in the grand scheme of things, bro, you, you're only halfway to 50, yeah. even 50 these days. You know, a lot of my coworkers are getting it like in their mid forties to fifties. And I'm like, man, being only halfway to that, like, 
you have so yeah. much time and you like wonder where 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 it all goes you just want to make the most of it while you can and oh yeah i God hope and pray that nobody like i hope and pray that you don't um and that i don't also yeah. but like i hope and pray that we don't um lose that perspective to where right. like, exactly. you, you want to seize every moment and every day and make the most of it and just you know try to attack any anything you possibly can because you know like you said like you never know how much time you have you know god forbid yeah. but like i'm just thinking like you know thinking about my my own my own yeah. parents like they're in their 60s and they yeah. still and they still you know they have the perspective of like my mom is always learning my dad yeah. he never stops working like it's like yeah and it, but like they love what they do each and right. every day too yeah. so um you never want to waste moments you never want to waste time so that's that's a good perspective to have that's good. even like bro like I broke my foot and like my basketball career was over. I was just like, like damn, bro. Like it's crazy how shit just for, changed. For not for like, not for long. Not yeah, now yo, yeah, I don't think it kind of like the professional thing changed, but like it's yeah. just kind of like like it's crazy, like within a split second, like you know, life could just that's why you really gotta just enjoy every moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And make the most of it and have that perspective. That's great. Um okay. Talking yeah. about talking about a little bit more about your injury, I think this could be very helpful for people. Um, what piece of advice could you give to an athlete that hits adversity like that, like an injury, ad, a, like a, mm -hmm. has an injury, the same injury twice in the matter of, you know, a few short months after doing a full rehab and playing a couple of games, like what, what sort of advice would you give to someone who's going through a situation like that? Because I know it can't be easy. Oh, <laughs> Now, when I say this, it's gonna sound uh, like it might it might be misconstrued in a sense. So I'll, I'll explain it after. But you okay. really just let go. Like I, I literally like like what did they like? Uh, there's this Buddhist teaching that says attachment is uh, the root of all suffering, right? So hmm. I was uh, so a lot like when I when I when I got first got hurt, right? This is uh, this is where like attachment is the root of all suffering, right? So when I first got hurt, I was like. It's like, damn, all right, cool. Uh, I got hurt, you know, I broke my foot. All right, cool. I just take a quick break, you know, like this, this ain't nothing. This, ain't, this, this ain't gonna slow me down, or nothing like that, right? Because I wanted mm -hmm. to play that, so I was so attached to it, right? Yeah, and so like, I want to say, like, maybe like eight weeks later, right? I was ready to get back to it, I was ready to get back in the gym, you know, I was ready to get back, you know, with my trainer, you know, I was ready to get back out there, right? Because I was like, so like, I was like, like, this is my identity, bro. Like, I like, like, I need this, like, basketball stuff, right? Like, mm -hmm. I need, it. and lo and behold you know, two months later, right, you know, I get hurt again, and it's just like, like, damn, like, you know, like, 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 wow, you just stuck there, you kind of stunned, like, you know, I thought I was done with this, you know, I thought I was healed up, you're right, I thought I was ready to move on, right, and right. it doesn't happen, and at that point, you know, I learned to just, like, let go, and, like, you really, like, if it comes back to you, it was meant to be, if it doesn't, you know, then it wasn't, right, yeah. so, like, I could have been like, yeah, I'm going to keep cooping. I'm going to keep working out, right? And the opportunity came up for me to go back overseas to China, right? So right. It, it comes, right? It definitely, if it's meant to be. And, like, had I been working out, I'd have went out there, you know, whatever. Right. Truly wanted to play. But yeah. I didn't. So this is what I'm doing now. So my biggest advice, like, if you, like, dealing with this, like, bro, like, just let go. Like, like let go. Like, you're injured. You can't play basketball. Like, just let it go right now until you can actually get back out there and see, like, how you feel about it after. So mm. yeah, it, whoever's dealing with like like please like let go. I know it's hard like at that point, but you really have to let go. Mm. And and I think that's something people don't hear enough of. It's like, um, you know, they get so hyper focused on their recovery and they get so hyper focused on what they're gonna be like when they get back. But sometimes, yeah, it's out of your control. Um, my mom always just said, my mom always says, let go and let God. Um, really? you know, and and she has that perspective on it, and I know a lot of other people do. So. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice, Jay. Um, yeah. All right, I guess the last thing I'll have yeah. you leave the people with today um, is just what's one thing, like what's one message you wish you could share with everyone at this point in your life? Like, I know there's a lot of advice you can give, but like what's what's one thing that's like on your mind, on your heart almost every day that makes you feel like, man, if if people could know this one thing, let me just get this out uh indecision uh indecision is a killer uh and i say that because you know when i was uh 
like after I had got hurt when uh like I was just so like like just stuck like because I was like this a basketball player for like a really long time and I was like you know is this is this for me right yeah and, like and I had felt like that like you know for a while I was like I just felt kind of like stuck like what's my next step right am I gonna keep playing basketball or you know am I gonna move on to do something else right mm. and for a long time that was just like in the back of my mind like you know like what am I people would come up to me and it was like so like what do you do like and I would be thinking to myself, like, yo, do I tell him I'm a basketball player? You know, am I, you know, a teacher? Like, whatever, right? And I was really indecisive on what I wanted to do. And so mm. one day I was just like, bro, like, you got to do something, bro. Like, yeah. so I hopped into this teaching stuff. I hopped into this urban planning stuff. And so when you saw me in July, like, really, like, start posting more, mm-hmm. one day I was just like, forget about it, bro. Like, like this you now. And, like, I kind of yeah. just being, like, head first in it. And honestly, like, even, like, this is how we talking right now, the, how we, how I'm a teacher, like in the summer, I was like, bro, I hope I can be like a long-term sub for, you know, a school. Mm-hmm. And the first time, the first, the first job I get, Hey, can you be a long-term sub? Right. Ooh. So, you know, I'm asking like, you know, and you know, this is what I wanted. Right. So I, I saw, I see a lot of tweets where it's like, you know, you can't, you can't be, uh, you can't be the person that you want to be by being like mysterious. You actually got to put yourself out there. So mm. like, don't be indecisive. You, you got to do something with yourself and whatever it is, you really got to get behind it. You really got to believe it. Like I really yeah. believe that the U S could be a more dense, walkable and more healthier community. Like I really believe that. And I really hope it happens. So yes. Yes. Yeah. I love that Jay, man. Masterclass. In oh, yeah. Just masterclass and beautiful answers all, all night long, Jay. Uh, Great, great. Are you asking the right questions, man? Yeah. <laughs> I had some time to think about it, you know? Yeah, see? Figure out what I want to ask. Oh, man. But it's it's such a good good time having you on, man. And, you know, I, you, you're you slowly convincing, not necessarily slowly, but you're convincing yeah. me as well uh, to advocate more for this or even just in my own daily life, like make the decision to walk somewhere, right. you know, I'm gonna start looking at e-bikes right now, bro. Like yeah, the second we get off, real. I'm about to start. Yeah. Hop, I'm about to hop on, see what I need to make or see what I need to save in order to get give me one. Cause I'm so big here. I'm big on you, e-bikes. Bro. Yeah. yeah, you've inspired me, bro. So um, keep doing that. Keep sharing, you know, your heart and your mind with the world. It's a better place because of people like you, Jay. So oh yeah, you know what you're doing, man. Get to it. All right. Thanks. Thanks for coming on, and thank you everyone for listening to this podcast. Peace.